For a good morning and welcome to morning worship in the parish of Castlechur and Gosainen as we begin our journey through Lent towards Holy Week and Easter. It's great to have you with us today. As part of our service, we're going to be beginning a, a series looking at the I Am sayings of Jesus today, beginning with one of his most familiar sayings, I am the bread of life. Also during the service today, our Mother's Union are going to be joining us for the wave of prayer. Now I absolutely love the Mother's Union and I have fond memories of the hard-working women of the Mother's Union that go way back to my childhood. Nowadays, of course, the Mother's Union is a modern, worldwide institution that includes not just women, but men too. And both Claire and I are really pleased and proud to be members of the Mother's Union here in our parish. Today, as part of our service, the Mother's Union join in a worldwide wave of prayer. Members of the Mother's Union throughout the world, millions of them are united by daily prayer. And groups of dioceses, including our own Swansea and Brecon, commit to praying for one another every day of every year. And today it's our turn as a parish to join in with that wave of prayer. And I hope that with members of the Mother's Union, you'll be incredibly blessed and encouraged by that. So as we begin Lent, let's start with the collect for today, the first Sunday in Lent. Almighty God, whose son Jesus Christ fasted for 40 days in the wilderness, and was tempted as we are tempted, yet was without sin. Give us grace to discipline ourselves in obedience with your Spirit, and as you know our weaknesses, so too may we know your power to save. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So together, let's worship.
The reading from St John's Gospel, chapter 6. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. This is indeed the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Then the Jews began to complain about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. in the morning when the world was begun and I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun I came down from heaven and I danced on the earth at Bethlehem I had my birth I danced for the scribe and the Pharisee but they would not dance and they wouldn't follow me I danced for the fishermen for James and for John they came with me and the dance went on Dancing wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance city And I'll lead you all wherever you may be And I'll lead you all in the dance city the Sabbath and I cured the lame. The holy people said it was a shame. They whipped and they stripped and they hung me on high. They left me there on a cross to die. I danced on a Friday when the sky turned black. It's hard to dance with the devil on your back. They buried my body and they thought I'd gone. But I am the dance and I still go on Dancing wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance city And I'll lead you all wherever you may be And I'll lead you all in the dance city down and I leapt up high. I am the life that'll never, never die. I'll live in you if you live in me. I am the Lord of the dance and he dancing wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance and he and I'll lead you all wherever you may be.
May I speak, and may you hear in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we begin a new series looking at the I Am sayings of Jesus, a series that will take us through Lent, Holy Week, and into Easter. And we begin with one of the most familiar of these sayings, I am the bread of life. I don't know if you noticed, but today's reading began with a crowd of people eagerly looking for Jesus. I think that they were looking for him because they knew what had just happened before today's reading began. Jesus had fed more than 5,000 people with a couple of fish and a few bread loaves. And of course, they may have been there. They may have experienced this and they may have had a belly full. And they were looking for Jesus because they wanted a repeat performance, another free meal. Whatever their motives, they go to Jesus today and he rebukes them. He rebukes them because they'd been overcome by the sign, but they hadn't understood it. They hadn't seen that it was an opportunity to draw closer to Jesus, to believe in him and to follow him. Do not work, he says, for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. In other words, don't get so excited by the things that don't really matter that you end up actually not seeing the things that do matter. Jesus, of course, in the feeding of the 5,000, had had compassion on the crowds. He'd met their practical need and he'd given them food to eat. But it's clear that his intention was actually to stir in them a deeper spiritual hunger, a hunger that would bring them deeper with him. And there's a challenge here for us. As we meet the needs of our community and its people, we do, of course, try to reflect the heart of God, a God who is concerned not just with our spiritual needs, but with our very real and practical needs too. We try to be the hands and feet of Jesus, who is deeply concerned for every aspect of our lives. But if our intention is to meet practical needs and practical needs alone, then we need to realise that that's never enough, is it? Because it never meets our deepest need, our need to know God, our needs to be forgiven, and our needs to enter into a relationship with our Father. So in striving to serve our community, we always have to ask ourselves, is this helping people to experience Jesus and to grow in their own personal knowledge and experience of him? The work of God is this, Jesus says in the passage, to believe in the one who he sent, that is Jesus. And I think that the church is really good at busying herself with many things. But if those things are not bringing people to the point where they're ready and where they're willing to become disciples of Jesus, then perhaps they're missing the point. Lent, of course, is a good time to pause. It's a time to take stock and to think about what we do and why we do it. And crucially, whether or not it's relevant nowadays. The crowds were obviously excited by what they'd heard and by what they'd seen. But had they understood it? Perhaps not. Because Jesus had just miraculously fed 5,000 people with next to no food. And what they do next is ask for a sign. Give us a sign like our ancestors had when God gave them manna to eat in the wilderness. Now talk about not seeing the wood from the trees. Those events, of course, would have been right at the forefront of their minds because John has already told us that all of these things take place during the Passover, a time when God's people had gathered together to remember that God had rescued their ancestors from slavery slavery to the Egyptians, and led them out of Egypt into a new and promised land. The rescue was accompanied by lots of signs and wonders, 
The most crucial of these, of course, was the Passover itself. When God passed through Egypt in judgment, judgment of a harsh and cruel Pharaoh who had mistreated the Israelites, God's people. And after 11 increasingly strong warnings to repent, God eventually sends an angel to strike down all the firstborn of the Egyptians, whilst all of God's own people, who'd been obedient to God and followed his command, painting the doorposts of their homes with the blood of the sacrificial lamb, were passed over and left unharmed. Finally, of course, this encourages Pharaoh to do what Moses had initially asked, to let the Israelites go free and to worship God in the desert. What followed was a period of testing and a period of trial, as freedom from slavery and life in the wilderness was not exactly as they'd imagined it to be. There were lots of miracles along the way. God provided food for them to eat and water for them to drink. But there was a tendency, of course, for them to stop. To stop and to look back to what was. To grumble as they began to look back to their time in captivity. Well, life was hard, yes, but at least in captivity they had food to eat and water to drink, and at least it was safe and familiar. Now moving forward is never easy, and there's always a temptation, of course, to look back, to look back to what was, even when what was was perhaps not really very good, certainly far from perfect. But we can still be tempted to retreat, to go back to our own personal captivities because of the fact that we're afraid to venture into the unknown, because we look back to what was safe and familiar, or because we're simply too tired to move forward to something new. Yet, this story reminds us that there was a promised land ahead. God had many blessings in store for his people, blessings that they would have otherwise missed if they'd not journeyed on. In some places, it feels as if the church today has in many ways lost the plot, that it's looking back, enslaved by tradition, and it's afraid to move forward into new seasons of blessings. Let me be clear. God wants to pour out his blessings on us. He wants each and every one of us to experience and to know a new time of blessing and growth. He wants to lead us in to that new time of blessing and growth. But we have to have the courage to venture into the unknown and to move forward with him. And if we refuse, then God will simply find others to be a channel for those blessings. For many, this lockdown has been something of a wilderness experience. And it can be tempting to look back, to look back and to hanker for the time when things were as they were before. But the world will have changed when we get out of this. And so must the church too. This wilderness experience has provided a decisive break with our time in Egypt, with the old and familiar that for a long time has failed to produce fruit for the kingdom. And it gives us a chance to venture into a new and promised land, into a new season of blessing. But we need to be up for it. We need to go for it. Are we ready? Ready to embrace it? Or are we simply going to be sitting around grumbling, hankering for what was and looking back? To stand still is to move backwards as the church appears to become increasingly irrelevant to those that it seeks to serve. 
And of course, as those who are nourished by what we've always done, become fewer and fewer until in the end there's no one left. Change is costly, yes, but resisting change is far, far more costly. To embrace change is to take the best of the past with us into the future, but to resist it is to, resi is to risk putting everything at stake and losing everything. A good measure of how relevant we are today, how effective we are at doing the work of God, is to look for evidence that we're helping other people to develop and to grow as disciples of Jesus. Are we doing that? If not, are we truly doing what we ought to do? Or are we simply keeping ourselves busy, keeping the show on the road until the last one out turns off the lights? The Israelites may have lost heart, but God was still at work. He heard their grumblings. At twilight, he gave them meat to eat, and in the morning, he gave them bread. And this wasn't a simple act of kindness to meet their practical needs. It was an act so that they might know that God was indeed God, and that he was rescuing them out of the oppressive grasp of a wicked pharaoh, bringing them out of Egypt into a new and promised land. Do you remember the words of that great and well-known hymn? Guide me, O thou great Redeemer, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me now and evermore. They're words that resonate with every one of us who are rugby fans, aren't they? But they're not words meant for terrified rugby fans looking at the opposition coming onto the field. They're words that were written for the people of God. I am weak, but thou art mighty isn't a song to be sung by the wing in the presence of the great Jonah Lumu. Instead, they're words to be sung by Christians. Christians who know that God is with us, that God will take us into a new and promised land of blessing, a season of growth, a future that will flourish and thrive. So we need not fear moving forward because God is in it with us. In Numbers 27, Moses appeals to God. May the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, appoint someone over our community to go out and to come in before us. One who will lead us out and bring us in so that the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. And God repeats this promise of a new and better leader who will come and rescue his people and take them into a new and promised land. There, he promises that his people will one day experience the company of a true shepherd who will take them by the hand and walk them into that promised land. In Isaiah 40, we see that same idea of God being with his people. His presence, powerfully rescuing them, is recorded there for us to see. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a pathway for God. He's going to come to his people in the desert. He's going to come to his people who are like grass, their glory fading. He's going to come with power. He will rule and he'll tend his flock like a shepherd who gathers the lambs in his arms, carrying each and every one of them close to his heart, gently leading them. The promise is that God, in person, 
will come to his people, that God will lead his people into a new time of blessing, bringing them into a promised land. The feeding of the crowd, immediately before today's reading begins, echoes the feeding of the Israelites in the wilderness, and its purpose is the same. It's so that we might know Jesus to be God with us. The fulfilment of that promise made long ago in the Old Testament. The Jews were gathered together for Passover. They would have remembered the miraculous feeding of their ancestors in the wilderness. They would have rejoiced in that promise made by God of a new and better leader that was to come. God among them who would meet their deepest need and take them into a new place of blessing, a promised land. Yet, when Jesus comes among them and when he feeds the 5,000, they're so preoccupied by the business of religion that they fail to see that everything that they were celebrating actually pointed to Jesus. It's almost like they were waiting for a bus that they'd stood at the bus stop for a long time. And when that bus finally appears, they choose not to get on it. So of course, faced with the reality of this, Jesus spells it out clearly. I, Jesus, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. It's all about me, he's saying. I'm the one that you've been waiting for. The wait is over. God has kept his promise. I'm that new and better leader. Believe in me. Trust in me. Follow me. Jesus, the bread of life, will meet your deepest need. In his death, he'll conquer death. He'll have power over sin. And in his rising again, he'll restore our relationship with God, the relationship of a rebellious people with a loving father. And that's God's will, that everyone would look to his son and believe in him and have eternal life. There'd be no more illness, no more suffering or pain or death, but only life, life in all its fullness. That's an incredible promise. It's a promise that should banish all fear, drive it out. However, many of those people who were there, looking at these events, seeing what was happening, they simply looked at Jesus and they believed him to be the carpenter's son, the son of Mary and Joseph, who they knew. And so, who is Jesus for you? Do you truly know him to be for who he really is? Emmanuel, God with us. Or do you simply reduce him to the ordinary, the son of a carpenter, Mary and Joseph's boy, a good teacher, or a prophet at best? If that's how you see him, then there's very little wonder that you're afraid about venturing forward. Perhaps this season, Perhaps Lent is an opportunity for us to rediscover the identity of Jesus, to banish fear and to journey forward, not in our strengths, but in his strengths. To stop looking behind to what was and to what has always been. And instead to take God by the hand and to journey with him into a future that he is preparing for us into a new season of blessing. He is the one that meets our greatest need. Our greatest work is to know the one that God sent. To 
to do so, must, we must be ready to use every tool at our disposal, old and new, lest people today be left spiritually hungry, or dare I say it, even starving. Amen. We now begin our Mother's Union wave of prayer by giving thanks to our prayer links across the world and for the privilege of prayerful support that we both give and receive. We gather to commit ourselves afresh to upholding our unity in prayer in the year ahead. With thankfulness and love, we take our place in the family of the Mother's Union worldwide. Open our eyes to the significance of relationship with members worldwide, with those we know and those we don't know. With support and love, we reach out to our sisters and brothers across the world. Strengthen our commitment to those with whom we share our visions and values, wherever we may live. In unity and love, we link hands with our worldwide family of God. Unite us in worship, build us in service, as together we seek to share your love. God our Father, as we prepare to observe the season of Lent, help us to make sensible decisions about how we are to do this. May our aims be worthwhile for our spiritual development, but achievable so that we will not feel that we have failed. We look forward with anticipation to Lent and the opportunities for deeper prayer and study. May we take these opportunities to learn, to grow, and to develop our faith and commitment. Loving Lord, you have called us from many nations and people. We ask you to bless the work of Mother's Union and prosper its presence throughout the world. 
Give vision and wisdom to those who hold office and serve on its councils. Unite its members in faith and love and grant us your peace in our hearts and homes. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Loving Lord, as we bring to you our prayers for Mother's Union worldwide, the candles on our prayer table have been lit to represent each of our linked dioceses as a symbol of our prayers on their behalf and the light of Christ which shines across our world. We pray for our worldwide president, Mrs. Sharan Harper, those involved in her leadership and all who work in Mary Sumner House. We give thanks for the blessing of being united in worship with our prayer partners across the world and for the opportunities we have had to build relationships through visits and social media. We thank you for the times when lack of news has driven us to pray and intercede and we pledge to continue to remember all our sisters and brothers in prayer. And so, we pray for the Diocese of Free State in Southern Africa and their President, Mrs. Elsie Chakalini. The Diocese of Bondo in Kenya and their President, Mrs. Janif Elkodia. The Diocese of Offa in Nigeria and their President, Mrs. Felicia Seconi. The Diocese of Ogbia, also in Nigeria, and their President, Mrs. Felicia Orobori. The Diocese of Argentina and the Amare Coordinator, Mrs. Mariana Lang. The Diocese of Uruguay and the Amare Leader, Mrs. Mercedes Tarragona. And finally, we pray for our own Diocese of Swansea and Brecon, our President, Mrs. Sally Friedman, and all members throughout the world. May God be with them in every part of their lives, encouraging them and leading them, sheltering and strengthening them, so that they may work to your praise and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now we turn to the familiar words of the Mother's Union prayer. Loving Lord, we thank you for your love so freely given to us all. We pray for families around the world. Bless the work of the Mother's Union as we seek to share your love through the encouragement, strengthening and support of marriage and family life. Empowered by your spirit, may we be united in prayer and worship and in love and service reach out as your hands across the world. In Jesus' name, Amen. The personal prayer of our founder, Mary Sumner, speaks to us of her commitment to sharing her deep faith through all that she did in her daily life. All this day, O Lord, let me touch as many lives as possible for thee, and every life I touch, do thou by thy spirit quicken, whether through the word I speak, the prayer I breathe, or the life I live. Amen. Let us turn to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask you to listen to our prayers and help us to trust in you, believing that no prayer goes unheeded, no word to you is ever uttered in vain, and no high cry for help is ever ignored. Loving Lord, you are our provider, our deliverer, our sustainer, hope and strength. Thank you for holding us safely in the palm of your hand and thank you for sending your precious Son, Jesus Christ, as the bread of life to nourish us day by day, knowing that we will never hunger or thirst if we just believe. Feed us with that spiritual food which promotes love and our faith in you. Strengthen us for serving others so that they too may know your love. In this period of Lent, we come to you aware of our unreadiness for the enormity of the Easter message that Christ suffered and died for us and yet was raised in glorious victory. Grant us healing in our souls and in the souls of all who search for meaning in their lives. Bring us back to that place where our journey began when we said that we would follow the way that you first trod. Lead us to the cross and meet us there. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we bring before you our prayers for the church and praise you that in your love for men and women throughout the world, you have formed a community of believers in every tribe and language. We remember churches struggling for survival. We pray for Christians drained of energy and resources and those who thirst for your presence and saving power. Bless and protect the leaders that you are raising up, that they may serve you in joyful obedience to your word. Guide the decisions and actions of both the powerless and powerful, and may those placed in authority exercise careful stewardship of the world's resources and bring help to the world's most vulnerable. May the power of love overcome the love of power to the glory of your name. In our own land, we pray for Archbishop John and all clergy for their ministry during these difficult times. In our parish of Kasluchur and Gosainen, we pray for our ministry team, for Adrian, Andrew, Glyn and Elizabeth, and we pray for all our active lay ministers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, creator and sustainer of all that is, we pray for your world and all its people. You are the one to whom we can turn at times of crisis. You are the one who sustains us in the ups and downs of our lives. In the midst of this pandemic, we mourn for those who have died and hold before you those who are suffering the effects of COVID-19 or from any other illness, especially those who are finding it difficult to access the treatment that they need. We thank you for the dedication of all NH staff, for carers and all those who work to keep us supplied with all that we need to keep us as safe as possible in these dark days. We pray that you will sustain, uphold and protect them day by day in all that they do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask your blessing on all who live and work here in our local community. Lord Jesus, you taught us to love our neighbour and to care for those in need as we would care for you. In this time of anxiety, give us the strength to comfort the fearful, to tend the sick and to assure the isolated of our love and of your love. May they know your presence in their isolation, your peace in their turmoil, and your patience in their waiting. We pray for all the children and young people whose education has been so greatly affected by lockdown. And we pray for all teachers and lecturers who are working so hard to provide meaningful education together with an army of parents and grandparents who have been struggling with homeschooling. As we think of children, Lord, we pray for all the children in Yemen who are suffering and the many who have been killed in the atrocities of the civil war. We pray that good will overcome evil and love will overcome hate. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, Lord, we pray for ourselves. We give thanks for our reconciliation through the work of the cross, and we offer ourselves as peacemakers in a world that cries out for peace. Open our eyes, Father, to your world full of beauty, love, and grace. Remind us of your Son, our Saviour, who brings forgiveness and hope to broken, hurting people. And may your Holy Spirit equip us with wisdom, truth, and the desire to bring about your kingdom in our hearts, homes, communities, and world. In Jesus' name we pray. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you've been encouraged and blessed as you do so. During our service today, we've talked about a God who cares not just about our spiritual, but our very real and practical needs too. And do remember that as lockdown continues, we are still here for you. If there's anything we can do, whether that be picking up a prescription, helping with shopping, or helping to turn isolation into connection by connecting you with somebody who might chat with you on the telephone, then do get in touch with us and do let us know. One of our wardens, Rob Samuel, is coordinating a team of callers. And if you're not already getting a call but you'd like one, please be in touch so that we can arrange it. Also during the week, we continue with our virtual Lent course on Zoom. And if that's something that you'd like to join in with, then do get in touch. We'd love you to journey with us towards Holy Week and Easter. But finally, as a new week begins, let me pray for God's blessing over us. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.